All right, great. I'm going to start. Um, so, yeah, if you could sit down, that would be great. Um, okay, so today we're going to sort of switch gears a little bit, um, and I'll tell you sort of a second general category of hardness arguments uh, for these quantum experiments. We're going to talk about the hardness of uh, scoring sufficiently well on various benchmarks that people have considered. Um, so, Here's sort of my story for, for my, my pitch for why this might make sense. Um, you know, so far we've modeled uh, the error in our experiment or our, our, our random circuit purely in terms of bounded total variation distance, right? That's the only sense in which we were talking about error. But that's extremely restrictive, right? It's extremely restrictive for, for several reasons. One, because, you know, TVD is, is difficult to measure, and I mean that in a, a really formal sense, which is that, you know, if you can imagine that you have some distribution, like the distribution of some near-term experiment, it's outputting samples, and then your goal is to test whether those samples uh, are close in TVD to the ideal outcome if it made no, if it made no noise, right? Um, if there are no errors. Well, it's, it's, you know, there are a lot of famous results that give sort of sample complexity lower bounds for that task, showing that you need an exponential number of, uh, of, of, of samples uh, from the, the, the box that's outputting samples to, uh, to test if the TVD is close or not. And in fact, this is true even for comparatively sort of modest tasks. Like even if you want to tell if the distribution is uniform or far in TVD from uniform, even that you know, would take an exponential number of samples. So, so TVD is not something that we can measure, at least not if we, with, with, you know, if we don't want to make any more further assumptions about the sort of device. Um, and then the second thing I sort of also mentioned before, you know, closeness and total variation distance is not a reasonable model of uncorrected noise, right? In the sense that, you know, so far we've been talking about sort of asymptotics, right? The system is getting really large. And when you're thinking about TVD, it only really makes sense to talk about sufficiently small constant TVDs, um, you know, because the uniform distribution is a constant far and constant close, however you think about it, in TVD to the ideal distribution. So it only makes sense if we think about small constant, uh, small constants in TVD. And if if, we're, if, if the the system size is growing, that sort of means that in some sense, as the system size is getting bigger, the error isn't changing, which is not a, a particularly reasonable model for near-term experiments, which tend to see things more like the fidelity or the quantum signal as sort of decaying exponentially um, if we're not sort of sufficiently reducing our, our, our noise as the system size grows. So, you know, I, I think what's really natural to ask, and I think the starting point for, for these benchmarks is, you know, is, is precisely this question, is there a quantum signal in random circuits that's somehow easier to verify and easier to, to implement? Okay, that might make sense. Make, might make more sense for a noisy experiment. Okay. Now, so what are the candidates? Um, well, almost all of them rely on this property of random circuits, which we're going to call the Porter-Thomas property. Okay, uh, this is the property of ideal random circuits. Uh, so, what does this mean? Well, what it what it means is that each output probability is exponentially distributed. Right, or a little bit more formally, the probability over the choice of circuit that the outcome probability of any particular outcome x, so any fixed outcome, is equal to q over n is exponentially distributed in minus q, right? So what this means, of course, is that, you know, this distribution is not, you know, each, the output distribution of each outcome is not flat, it's not uniform, but it's kind of flat-ish in the sense that, you know, most of the outcomes are maybe around 1 over 2 to the n, some are a little heavier than that, maybe by a constant. Some are a little lighter than that. But you don't have a tremendous variation of, uh, of probabilities in this distribution, right? Um, <clears throat> now, where did this come from? Now, this is actually a little bit subtle, so let me tell you what I know about this. Um, so this is, this is true for Haar random unitaries. Let me tell you what I mean. Suppose you take a truly Haar random n qubit unitary. So this is not a circuit. It's a matrix, a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix. And I ask you, you know, what is the distribution of each entry of that matrix? So this is well known uh, in the random matrix theory community, and what is the answer? It's, ga it's Gaussian, right? It's a Gaussian. So, you know, now, now you know, the, the right analogy here would be, that would be sort of the amplitude, and the right analogy is the probability. So we would be squaring a Gaussian, and that's sort of what we're, what we're trying to, uh, to get across here, okay? It's kind of like a squared Gaussian distribution. Um, now, it's this this Porter Thomas uh, you know um, property is conjectured to be true even for sort of approximations 
of the global harm, the harm measure. So for example, we, we think we see it even in relatively shallow depth quantum circuits, but you know, generally speaking, this is not proven. Okay? This, is, this is something that's numerically observed and that a lot of people believe, even at relatively shallow depth, say square root n depth and 2D grid. Uh, but it's not something that we have a proof for. Okay? And it's not something that we know follows from something like a, a two design or a K design. Okay? So this is really based on analytics. Um, <clears throat> but based on this property, which again implies that most of the outcomes are pretty sim most of the outcome probabilities are pretty similar, some a little heavier than others, there's something really natural we can ask, which is, you know, in terms of quantum signal, could it be that there's a hard quantum signal in outputting heavy outcomes? Right? So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we choose a, a random circuit, right? And then we you know, we run the ra that random circuit, we fix it now, so it's fixed, we run it on the all zeros state many times, right? When we measure, naturally we're going to get outcomes that occur with relatively heavy probability, and we'll formalize what we mean by heavy in a moment, but, you know, the heavier probabilities are going to come out more, more likely than not, okay? Um, <clears throat> right, and so the question is, is how, how difficult is that to do, the, is, you know, is this to do classically? So if I give you a random quantum circuit, how difficult is it to, to sort of figure out what the heavy outcomes are, okay? Something a quantum computer does naturally. And this is, I think, exactly the intuition um, behind one of the first benchmarks for random circuits, um, which is called heavy output generation, or I'll abbreviate it using HOG, H-O-G, okay? Uh, due to Aronson and Chen from 2017, and you know, it's exactly what they were saying. So they said, Here, here's the definition that we're going to use for what heavy means, right? We're going to, uh, you know, we're, we're, with respect to the output distribution of the circuit, right, and certain outcome x, which is just an n-bit string, okay, we'll call an outcome heavy uh, if it's above median in the outcome distribution of the circuit. There's nothing particularly special with median, just something that sort of nicely formalizes what we mean by heavy. If you're like me and you haven't thought about um, you know, exactly what median means for a while, uh, you know, it's, very, it's a very simple concept. You simply sort the outcome distribution. That's, that's this vector here. I'm thinking about a, a, you know outcome distribution of two to the n probabilities. And you sort of choose the, medi the, the middle one. Yeah, that's the median. OK, um, okay great. So now, so now here's the hog problem. Uh, we're given a random circuit, and we're asked to output strings uh, x1, x2 through xk, you can think of k as a constant if you like, um, but it doesn't matter too much. You want to output, you, you, want, you want two thirds of those strings that you outputted, the x1 through xk, to be heavy. And now heavy meaning with, hev you know, heavier than median in the outcome distribution. Okay. Um, so this is something we can do with a quantum computer, like I mentioned earlier, simply by taking the random circuit, running it on all zeros, and measure many times. This uses a property of, uh, of Porter-Thomas distribution, right? Because um, notice that this is clearly, this would be clearly false for, uh, you know, for loads of different circuits. You know, there's no reason that the median would have to be so large, right? But what you can calculate using the Porter-Thomas distribution um, is that with very high probability over the choice of circuit, the mass of the distribution that's above median is going to be bounded by a constant away from half, like 0.7, something like that, okay? And so then we can use a Chernoff bound to show that at least two-thirds of the outputs are heavy with high probability, right? This is not so hard. You're, it's the same thing as sort of flipping a bias coin and, 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 and you know, estimating the bias, right? This is the same idea. Okay, so questions about this? pretty clear what hog is and why we can solve it with a quantum computer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a zero-bit choice of two thirds is like, un, like it, it's not arbitrary, right? I couldn't make it yeah. amplify it one minus one over power eight. Yeah, right. You, 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 okay. There's a whole bunch of, you, you can, you, you, right. you can do other things, but you'd have to be careful about the parameter settings. The parameter settings are not completely arbitrary. There's a complicated dependency between a number of them, yes. Um, other questions? We're good. This is not too hard, though, right? That should be the message. Um, okay, now, why is this attractive to us? Well, so first things first. Um, hog doesn't seem like it's too different from these tasks that we were talking about before. In fact, it kind of seems like a sampling task. 
right? It seems like it's not so far removed from the task of just sampling from the output distribution of the circuit, okay? Now, strictly speaking, it's not a sampling task. It's a relation task, if you want to call it that, right? In other words, the input is a random circuit and the output are, you know, a whole bunch of outcomes. It's not necessarily samples, but, you know, it's, it's very, it, you know, it's, it's clearly not too far away from the task of just sampling from the output distribution, because, of course, if you sample from the output distribution, you're going to get heavy outcomes. That's the whole point, okay? Um, so it seems like a, just a weaker sampling task, right? So, so the question is, why should this be hard for a classical computer, okay? W you know, we, we, we spent the entire time in the last few days talking about the hardness of sampling. Now we're making the task weaker, right, because to solve hog, you don't necessarily have to sample from the distribution. You just have to sort of have a proxy for what, is the heavy out what are the heavy outcomes and what are the light out uh, outcomes. It's a formally easier task. But then proving it's hard should be even harder, right? Okay. So, so Aronson and Chen think about this. And the best thing they come up with is, is the following, which is that this hog problem is classically hard, assuming another conjecture, which they call quaff. Quath, I, I think, stands for quantum threshold assumption, okay? So let me tell you what Quath is. It says the following. No efficient classical algorithm takes as input a random circuit with a lot larger number of gates than qubits, so m is much greater than n, um, and decides if a single outcome probability, like the all zeros outcome, is heavy, that means above median, right, with probability that has an exponential in n bias, okay? So, okay, so this is obviously a custom conjecture. I'm not aware of anyone um, making this conjecture before, uh, you know, before these, these random circuits were considered. Um, but, but what's the motivation? So have we made progress? And I think it's fair to say it's not clear if this makes progress, right? In other words, I think, you know, why not, why not just conjecture that hog is hard and be done with it, right? Why, why, is, why is, you know, uh, going through a reduction and showing that this, this quath problem uh, sort of suffices, this quath conjecture suffices to show that hog is hard? Why is this interesting? I think the motivation is something like this. Um, you know, unlike the sampling task, Right? It sort of seems, at least at a high level, that this quath task looks like a computation of an output probability. Right? It's a non-standard computation of an output probability because it's not asking you to output the probability with really high precision like what we were talking about or something like that. It's just sort of asking you to take a fixed outcome and sort of gauge, roughly speaking, how heavy it is. Right? But it seems like we might have better insight for what the best sort of classical algorithm might do for this sort of task. Right? Whereas hog, it's a sampling problem. I think the thought was it was not so clear. Here, it seems like it's really hard to imagine how you would solve the quath problem without sort of getting some estimate to the output probability. That, that's the intuition. There's, there's not much more than that other than an intuition. Um, but but I think the intuition is also served by the history here, right? Because I think if you think about what we were doing before, right, in the last few days, we started with a sampling problem, not too different from hog, right, a stronger version of hog, but then we immediately reduced using the Stockmeyer reduction to a computation problem. And the reason we did that was because then we could get a handle um, on the hardness. We could make very non-trivial complexity theoretic statements, you know, I, you know, admittedly, we still can't prove the hardness without conjectures and so on, but we could at least say something interesting other than, okay, we'll conjecture it's hard to sample because I don't know how to do it, right? I think this is a very, very similar intuition. I think that's important to appreciate. I think the point was that Hogg seems extremely close to what the quantum computer is really doing. It's not that different from sampling. Quath seems like it's computing uh, an output probability. We actually do have some good evidence that computing output probabilities of random circuits are hard. You just saw that. We also understand better sort of the, the type of simulation algorithms, classical simulation algorithms, that exist to compute these sorts of quantities. So it seems like maybe ma making this conjecture was a bit less of a shot in the dark. Uh, and that's, that was sort of the idea, okay? Um, other thing I want to say about this conjecture is that the, the bias scaling exponentially in N number of qubits rather than m is really important. Because remember, we've made this assumption that the size is much greater than m. So there's a big difference here. And it turns out that it's not hard to show, 
uh, which means I won't quite show it, but I'll hand wave it, um, that there are uh, classical algorithms that, that do work to compute output probabilities, or rather solve this problem, this heaviness problem, with, with, with a bias that scales exponentially in the system size rather than in n, okay? And, and the way you do this essentially is you, you write this, this probability out as a Feynman path integral, much like we did um, you know, uh, a day ago or two days ago, whatever, in the worst average case reduction. And you just randomly guess a small number, like a polynomial number of paths. You evaluate the values of the paths, and you accept if it's larger than some predefined threshold, which I won't calculate, but it's pretty simple. And, then, and what's not too hard to see uh, is that this works with, with a bias over random guessing, that's the half, right, that scales with like the number of paths in the Feynman path integral, okay? Because um, sort of you, you'd expect that all of the values of the paths and each of the values of the paths individually are about the same, right? Um, it's true in expectation, actually. Uh, so you sort of assume that they're all the same. Uh, and so it seems like the best thing you can do is just guess an efficient number of them, polynomial number of them, see what that is. That gives you some signal, but it's very small. Okay. Um, okay. That's, that's, I think, the motivation for this. Now, how does the reduction work? And maybe you can help me with this, because it's actually not that hard. So I want to show that if quath is true, that is, if it's hard to, you know, if you give me a, a single outcome like all zeros, and you ask me, is this heavy or not? I can do that with, you know, and, and, and that's hard to do, even with inverse exponential and n bias, then that implies that hog is hard. In other words, it's hard to output a list of outcomes, most of which, say two thirds or greater, are heavy in the output distribution. So how, how, would, how would you do this? Any ideas? Sort of an obvious thing you can do. So maybe I'll start and then you, tell, you jump in, okay? We're gonna prove this by contrapositive, right? So we want to show that quath is true implies hog is hard. Contrapositive, hog is easy. Quath is false. So let's say hog is easy. What does that mean? I have an algorithm. It, it's a classical algorithm, it spit, but that's not super important for this reduction. It spits out uh, um, outcomes. And at least two-thirds of these outcomes are heavy in the output distribution of the circuit that we're giving the algorithm. Okay? Now what we want to know to falsify quath is, is a particular outcome, like all zeros. Of course, there's nothing important about all zeros. It could be any of them, but some fixed outcome. Is that heavy or not? Okay, can you help me out? So, all right, so I'm gonna start. I use the hog algorithm. I run it. It li outputs a list. What do I do? Do you see zero? Yeah, do you see zero? That's it. That's all you do. Now, now hold on. You can already see why the bias takes a huge hit, right? Because this distribution is essentially flat. Right? It's not, not exactly flat. If it was flat, this would be meaningless. But it's not, but, and that's the whole point. But it's essentially flat. It's not, not too far from being flat. Right? So even if 0 to the n is heavy, you know, it maybe occurs with probability 2 over 2 to the n or something like that, there's an inverse exponential chance that you'll see it. Right? It's just 2 over 2 to the n. It's not, five, uh, not, not 0.5 or something like that. It's, 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 it's super small. But the, but the point is just that there's a small bias you know, that's a little better than guessing and in n, exponential in minus n, uh, in, in minus n uh, that sort of, you know, that, that sort of says it's, it's, it's more likely to happen, it's slightly more likely to happen if it's heavy. And it's on your list. Okay, so let's, let's prove it, although I think this is one of these things where the proof is more confusing than intuition, which is, I, is what I just said. It's essentially the same. But let's go through it anyway. Um, I think this is also a problem on the problem set, so uh, we'll get a good review here. Uh, okay, so, so let's, let's do this more formally. Um, so it turns out it's easier to, rather than asking if the all zeros outcome is heavy, it's easier to analyze the problem of asking, given a random circuit and a random outcome z, in, which is a binary string, is z heavy for c? But these things are the same difficulty. Right? In other words, it doesn't matter so much if we're thinking about a fixed outcome or if I choose a random outcome and then ask if that's heavy. Does anyone see why or have an intuition for why that would be true? So two problems. One problem is what we're asking. You're, you're given a random circuit. You, you ask, is the all zeros output, fixed outcome? Is that, is that heavy or, not, or light? Second thing is given a random circuit, then a random outcome, uniformly random z. Is that heavy or light? 
But these things are the same. Yeah. Yeah. Precisely. And then, and then, exactly. So that's exactly what we do. We take the random circuit. We draw a uniformly random Z. That's a, you know, n bit string. And then we add a layer to the circuit that just sort of permutes the outcomes. Right? I think formally speaking, it would be like you add an X gate uh, to the ith qubit if the ith bit of Z is one, and otherwise not. Right? So now this has the property that this new circuit, that maybe let's call it, call it C prime, has the property that the, zero, the Z string has exactly the same probability as the zero string, the all zero string in C, the original circuit. Right? But furthermore, that's not enough, right? We also want to show that the distribution of C prime, that's the circuit, the random circuit C, and then this extra layer of random X gates, that that's also har, har random, yeah? And, sorry, go ahead, yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly, and so this is a, a property of, of, of the har measure, right? You take, you take a har random circuit, you have two qubit gates, har random gates, then you just sort of have another layer where you have like some, some you know, random Z's or whatever, uh, excuse me, random subset of X's, it's still a random circuit. Okay, and so in fact these, these problems are the same, it just helps to analyze this problem to think not of a fixed outcome zero, but of a uniformly random Z. Okay, great. So that's the idea. Um, now the strategy is going to be, I think I say it's the same, I would say it's extremely similar, there's a, there's, there's a difference here, but let me tell you the strategy. So basically what we said, you use the assumed hog algorithm, it comes because we're taking the contrapositive, um, on C prime to output this list of, of outcomes, Z1 through Zk, so that at least two-thirds of them are heavy. Then, rather than just seeing if it's on the list, it's easier to, anal to analyze the case where you just pick a uniform outcome that you saw, uniform observed outcome in this list, and you, and, wh and what do you do? You say heavy, if the outcome ha is, 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 if you have a collision, if the uniformly random outcome that you, you, you chose of those, of the observed outcomes happens to be Z, which itself was uniformly random. Okay? So you pick one element of the list? No. Yeah, you pick, okay, yes. Not deterministically, you choose a uni uniformly random one of the list. Okay. You see, is that equal to Z? If it's equal to Z, okay. you accept, otherwise, yeah, in fact, otherwise you don't reject, in fact. There's a smarter thing you can do. What is the thing? So if, if you get a miss, so there's a hit, a hit you know you're going to say it's heavy. There's a miss, right? And then you flip a coin. Yeah? Okay, let's analyze this. It's really, really simple, and you're going to do it on your uh, problem set, so I'll just go through it quickly, and then you should just review it, okay? How do we analyze this? Well, it's really simple to see that there's two ways you can, you can, you can get the answer right, right? One is, if you get a hit, right, what probability does that occur with? Uniformly random outcome, uniformly random uh, thing that you're looking for, like one over two to the n, right? Uh, times two-thirds, why, why two-thirds? At least two-thirds, because two-thirds of the guys are heavy in the observed list, that's the, that's the turn off time. Okay, or the other way you can get it right is if you get a miss, that occurs with probability one minus one over two to the n, but then you flip correctly, okay? Well, it's median, so that's probability half. The point is you then do the algebra, and you get that this is one half plus a bias that's at least one over two to the n. I'll let you work that out, but that's just, uh, it's just, you know, doing, um, doing math. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. You you can do all you you can you can do all of these these variants depending on the parameters that you choose in the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, anything else? The, the reduction should be yeah yeah. Ah yes, coming coming. Thank you. Not not quite yet. We're still in theory land. We only care about hardness. We're not going to ask like how do we know that the you know uh, that it was there or something like. That. Uh, yes, in the back. That's right, that's exactly right. Because there are algorithms that work uh, with, with bias one over two to the m, about. No, 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 like square. 
like m equal n squared. Let, let's say that's a safe parameter setting. You can make it. You can you can you, you can do better by looking at exactly the coefficient. You know the, the, the thing, but we're not going to do that. Let's just set it to be n squared. Question. More more question before I go on. Okay, great. Let, let's keep going then. All right, so that's how it works. Now, Google, though, in, 20, in, 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 in well, 2016 and then later in 2019 with their experiment, they actually ended up using a different but very, very related benchmark uh, to, um, you know, to, test their, their to, to test their device. They called this linear cross-entropy. Right, we're going we're gonna to abbreviate it by XCB. Uh, let me describe to you what this is. Um, and, and if you... You know, if you get lost in the details, the thing I want you to remember about this is just that it's an alternative measure of heaviness, right? It's a slightly different measure of heaviness. I don't know a formal relationship between the hog problem and scoring well on this linear XEB problem, but the intuition is exactly the same. That's really what it is, okay? That's the important thing. So here's what it is. The XEB is a function of two distributions, one I'll call PXP, that's the experimental distribution, that's whatever your box is outputting. We want to make as few assumptions about that as possible. We don't want to make, you know, we don't want to be presumptuous about what that distribution is. And then P-ideal, right? P-ideal is, you know, you have in your hand the, the randomly chosen circuit, it's now fixed, okay? And the output distribution of that circuit when you measure all in qubits in standard basis is called P-ideal, okay? And what is this XCB? It's super simple. It's really, really easy to say. It's 2 to the n, that's a normalization factor. I would forget about it, okay? Times the dot product of these two distributions, if you think of them as 2 to the n bit, uh, bit, bit uh, vectors. That's all it is, okay? And sometimes a helpful way to think about this, we all can think about this as a, an 2 to the n times an expectation value of, of the ideal distribution with respect to the to, to X drawn from the, from the experimental distribution. That's nothing more than, you know, simplifying the expression. Okay? Okay, cool. So now, a few things to, to say, and these, these follow from Porter Thomas, and they're actually expectations, which I, which I missed here. Uh, I didn't have it. Uh, but if, if we have a perfect experiment, and PX is equal to P ideal, um, the expectation over the choice of circuit of XEB turns out to be two. It's not hard to work out if you know the, the Poor Thomas expression. It's just a simple integral. But if you're sampling from the uniform distribution, a distribution that's generally uncorrelated with the ideal distribution, the answer is one. It's not a complete coincidence. We normalized it so that that's true. Okay? It's nothing really special about two or one. It could be two over two to the two n or whatever. But that's, that's why we, we normalize things with this two to the n factor. Um, and so, here, but here's, here's why it's nice, and this is better than, I think this is the, the, the main reason why it's better than TVD, okay? It's the following, well, there's, there's many reasons, but this is, this is, I think, the main one. Uh, unlike TVD, XEB can be well approximated in a few device samples by uh, what I call concentration of measure arguments. I realize that sounds more vague than it is. I simply mean your sort of law of large numbers, <laughs> okay? Uh, it's not that hard. Uh, but it requires exponential time to compute the ideal output probabilities of observed samples. So what do I mean by this? So what does the experimentalist actually do to calculate this experiment, right? They take small number of observed samples, right, from PXP, right? Uh, I'm calling that Z1 through ZK, I think to be consistent with what we were doing earlier. Now, I compute two to the n, that's the normalization, right, times the arithmetic mean of the ideal output probabilities of these observed outcomes, okay? And it's not hard to show at all, again, using for a Thomas properties, in fact, the fact that the sort of second moment is, is well understood, that this well, that this well approximates the actual cross entropy with high probability, okay? Now, but, okay, so that's all simple. But there, there's, an, there's an interesting question here though, right? Which is how on earth do you actually compute that sum? It's true that that sum is not a huge sum. It's a small, relatively small number of terms. But they're all ideal output probabilities. Ideal output probabilities we actually believe to be hard. And in fact, that's what we, that was the moral of last time's lesson, if you, if you didn't catch that, right? Is that, you know, the reason, in fact, the reason we believe sampling is hard at the end of the day is because out, computing output probabilities is hard. So what, what on earth would we do? How would we compute this? This is where you have to stop thinking like a complexity theorist and start thinking like, um, you know, a large company that has a giant supercomputer uh, on their premises, right? Who, which will not be named. 
Um, so that's exactly what you do, right? You, you literally exhaustively compute the output probability of each of these observed outcomes. Okay, but the point is because it's sample efficient, you don't need that many of them. Okay? You take the arithmetic mean, you normalize. You use that as an XCB score. Um, okay, so now, oh sorry, any questions about that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you, you, can, you can work that out, like you can say like a multiplicative precision or a one over to the end, but let's just say it's exact. It's essentially what they do, yeah. Um, and you can also see that this is already causing some problems, right? It's, it's, and we, we go back now to the first lecture where I told you that we're really looking for a Goldilocks solution, right? If, we, if this is the score that we're intent on using to verify our random circuit, we're not interested in scaling the system to larger and larger sizes. It's not going to work, right? So we can talk about asymptotics all we want. Complexity theorists like me insist on talking about asymptotics because I don't know how else to prove rigorous hardness arguments. But fundamentally, we do not know how to verify these systems if the system size is sufficiently large. This may not be the best we can do. There might be an efficient way sort of hiding somewhere that, that you know, gives you a better way of doing this that's efficient. I don't know where that is. I'm not really that optimistic about it. Um, this is the way we currently verify these experiments. Yeah? Yes. Precisely, precisely, precisely. That's, that's a good, it, it's a good proxy, a first proxy. I mean, two to the n, you can do better than that a little bit, but the idea is the k. It's small. You don't have to go through all of the output probabilities. Mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to sample naively, right, you, you would have to do a much, much more uh, computation. But there's still exponentials. You're just sort of fighting over the exponential. Yeah? Of course, if n is 53, that might matter a lot. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Okay. How much time do I have, by the way? Um, half, an half an hour. Good. Okay, perfect. Uh, okay. So then, why is scoring well on XEB classically hard? All right. Well, Aronson and Gunn come into the picture have a very similar argument to what they argued before. So the first thing they do is they have a corresponding version call of, of, of hog, which they call X hog, which just more aptly captures the hardness of the XCB. Right? It's very, very similar to hog, because after all, you know, XCB itself is really similar to hog. Ah, I did want to say one more thing. Maybe you can help me out. So you, you have everything, I think, at your disposal now to answer this question. So I said that hog is really all about heaviness, and that's clear. And then I said that XCB, it's fundamentally about heaviness. Let's go back for a second. Yeah, here we go. Why is X, how can you see, even from this expression, that XEB is, is about heaviness? What do I even mean by that? Yeah, I mean, the way I think about it, very simply, uh, is that, you know, distributions, pairs of distributions that score well on XEB are going to be distributions that share, what, share? Heavy outcomes, right? That's, that's the intuition. I think if you read anything more into this, you're going to be missing the point. I think that's really the point, okay? Okay, cool. So, Aronson and Gunn, why, why is XCB classically hard? Well, because of X hog, all right? So here's X hog, X, X stands for XCB, of course, okay? Uh, here's what it is. Given the circuit C, output K distinct samples Z1, Z2 through ZK, so that the arithmetic mean of those samples is, that's the expectation, not the expectation over C, it's the expectation over I. C is fixed, you know? uh, I is just the number of samples, you know, um, K is the number of samples. Uh, so I is a uniformly chosen uh, sample. Okay, it's great, it should be hard to output these K samples so that the arithmetic mean of them, uh, the, the arithmetic mean of the output probability with respect to the ideal circuit is greater than or equal to B over two to the N. Why does this match XEB? Well, precisely because now we're just saying like it's hard to output a whole bunch of uh, strings that occur with slightly heavy probability. And heavy probability now is heavier than one over two to the n. Okay, great. When we think of B as one plus epsilon, and we have to be a little careful here, if we had a noiseless circuit, it's not hard to calculate what we should be seeing. And we should be seeing with very high probability B equal two. 
Right? So most of the outcomes that we observe should be something like 2 over 2 to the n. Um, the problem, though, is that noise can, have the, can cause the experiment to have considerably different values for b. In fact, depending on how you model noise, right, there are you know, very reasonable noise models for these random circuits, albeit a little bit simplified, increase entropy. Right? They keep increasing entropy. You actually reach the uniform distribution if you're not careful. Right? And so, in fact, in a real-world experiment, b is not going to be 2. Right? If you actually scale the experiment larger and larger, this, <clears throat> this epsilon is going to be more like 1 plus 1 over 2 to the d, something like that. Something that's, 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 that's you know, getting smaller and smaller and smaller as, in particular, the depth grows. It's not surprising at all. The signal, fundamentally, is decreasing if you're not correcting your noise, right? OK, but we're going to be complexity theorists, as we were with all of the other arguments, and we're going to assume that we have a constant score in the XCB. Okay? It's not true for an asymptotic random experiment. Thank goodness we're not talking about asymptotic noisy experiments. Okay? Okay, so in fact, though, Google scores 1.002 on its 53 qubit random circuit experiment. It's actually quite impressive, though. You know, the, first, okay, the first thing that anyone does always is say, oh my god, like that clearly seems like it's much closer to uniform, because uniform is one, <laughs> right? Then to two. But they were happy about this. Can you help me out? Why would they be happy? Why, why would anyone be happy about this? There, there are actually some really good reasons to be happy about this. No one's happy, though? Really? Wait, hold on. I just told you what the score should be. Well, anything more than one, I mean, if, it's, if it's exactly one and they couldn't resolve the difference, that's kind of upsetting. That means that someone was, you know, that there's no more power there than like flipping random coins. Is it a constant, you said? It, but it's not a constant. I mean, it is a constant at 53. Is it really a constant? Definitely not. Constant, it, again, this, is, this goes back to the same thing I've now talked about several times. Um, and subtle, and a lot of people make this mistake. But it's not a constant if things aren't scanned. I don't even know what it means. Everything is a constant in some sense, N nothing scaling. But I think the one reason that they're excited about that, well, okay, two. Um, there's sort of two reasons. One, if you really think that it's scaling with like 2 to the minus d or 2 to the minus even d times n, depending on what settings, of what parameters you're talking about, actually, this is a lot better than you'd expect from an asymptotic experiment, okay? Much, much better than some exponential in minus 53 or something like that, right? But also, um, <clears throat> or minus 53 times 20, if it's d times n, something like that. I mean, it's, it's actually a pretty big number. The other thing is, you know, what we care about, in some sense, is the complexity theory, definitely, to give us a, a feeling for how hard the task is in some mathematical, rigorous sense. But at the end of the day, we also care about the finite size experiment. And so Google's mentality here was that when we actually get a finite size score like this, we should be comparing this against the best classical, the best known classical algorithms run on, you know, <laughs> Google's giant uh, classical supercomputer, right? And in fact, it turns out that doing the same task, apples to apples, is not a trivial one, okay? So when they first came out with their result, they estimated that it would take their best supercomputer something like 10,000 years. You know, I have to say, I wasn't thrilled that they came out. They, they gave a prediction like that that looked a little bit optimistic. It turned out that the answer is probably more like a few minutes. If you really optimize the algorithm, you know, like 20 minutes or something, if you really optimize the algorithm, you use fastest supercomputer, is that quantum advantage or not? I don't know. That's kind of up to you. But the point is that, the point is that it's non-trivial to do even this 0.002. Okay? Um, questions about this? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, does it, does it? I mean, I don't know exactly what you mean by error correction. There were error mitigation strategies that were employed. They were certainly, there was post-selection, there was a whole bunch of different things. It's definitely not full-blown error correction. I don't know exactly what modeling, like modeling it theoretically. I guess we can try. I haven't done that. Yeah. 
Uh huh. Right, right, right. Exactly. Oh, I see. Can you, can you, what is? Can you prove rigorously that you can do better, or what? What is the hope? Uh huh. Yeah, I mean, look, they, they had loads of benchmarks. I'm sure many of them could be reflective of how well they're managing the error. I mean, one of them is cross-entropy, because they're doing better than 2 to the minus 53. I don't know exactly what, you know, what else you would want, but we can talk about it offline. Next question. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's very close to the uniform distribution, exactly. Uh huh. I didn't say that. I didn't say that. They, they, they made all sorts of statistical claims about how confident they were in this. We will not get into that because we're not going to go into the statistics at that level. But yes, they had very high confidence, uh, assuming a whole bunch of stuff. That's the, that's the problem. Uh, that this was. Yeah, okay. Let's talk about that offline. There's loads of assumptions, and I can tell you them. Some, I think, are very believable. Some a little less so. Um, it's a good question, though. I think I'm going to purposely refuse to answer that at the moment. Yeah? I have a clarification question. Yes. The definition of yes. Um, so, could you just show this slide? Yeah. No, 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 no. Uh, I, this is the expectation over a choice of random circuit. It's with respect to Porter Thomas that you do this. It's not with respect to any distribution. Super important. Other questions? So, so could you yeah. It, it's expectation over C of X E B of, of P X and let's say P sub C rather than P ideal. Whatever it is. Or what comes out of yes, what comes out of the device. You want to make, that's fixed. But what I'm saying is, right, it, it precisely. But what I'm saying, though, is in the ideal case, Px would be equal to P ideal. Yes, yeah, so, so Px is like you've collected it from your experiment. Yes. And then P ideal is um, the, the parameter that you put your expectation over. Is it? Like well, it's, that's right. I mean, sort of, exactly. Like, in the sense that what you do is you draw a circuit randomly, and then... And then that, that defines your P ideal. You. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Fantastic question. Remember, I was trying to say we we're not going to talk about noise, but it's such a great question. It's one of my favorite ones that I'll answer anyway. Uh, yeah, he was asking, you know, the fact that we sort of were measuring this against one, at least it kind of is indicative of the fact that we think maybe a failure mode would be like the uniform distribution. Um, and so he was saying, like, how reasonable is it asymptotically that we go to the uniform distribution? Fantastic question. Um, something that we've been thinking a lot about in my group, in fact. Uh, here, here's the answer to that. It's very, very clear that if we're talking about depolarizing noise, then you're clearly going to the uniform distribution. That's, that's, by the way, that's not deep. That's just because, you know, if you keep having a, a layer of random circuits, or, or, you know, random gates, two cubic gates, then you have depolarizing while you're adding your entropy, right? That's what depolarizing does. It pushes you to the maximally mixed state. Now you have another layer of hard random circuit pushed to the maximally mixed state. Of course you're going to the uniform distribution. Now there are interesting questions involving how quickly do you go to the uniform distribution. But there's, a, there's another question, which is, is that the right noise model? And it turns out the answer is no. It's not the right noise model. Right? We know it's not the right noise model. It's not, it doesn't capture everything in our system. When you add other noises, I think the question about whether you're going to the uniform distribution or not depends on a whole bunch of different things. So for example, it depends on, obviously, the noise channel itself. Right? Uh, it also depends, I think, on the rate of the noise. Is the rate of the noise weak, by which we mean sort of a uh, short hand for like one over the system size or a constant over the system size? Or is it a constant, not C over N, but constant, right? I think these all depend, I think this all depends. What does Google have? They think they're close to the uniform distribution. Is it true? 
not, not entirely clear. It's true that I think they have a high entropy distribution. It's not, it's not, clear, it's not clear how close it is to the uniform distribution. Yeah. Yes, 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 we don't know, we don't know. It's po absolutely possible, I think it's very possible, yeah. We're gonna talk about noise though, uh, hopefully at the, either the last lecture, I'm hoping the last lecture, or if not, you can read the slides, I have a whole thing on noise. These questions will come up, um, but, it's, it, but it's the right thing to ask. Um, okay, let me keep going. Okay, so why is, uh, why is XEB ho uh, hard, right, or why is XHOG hard, right, well, the analogy is hog is to quaff what XEB is to XQuath, of course, right? So uh, what is XQuath? Well, there's no efficient classical algorithm. That given as input, a random circuit C produces an estimate, P, to the output probability of all zeros with the following. And now I'm going to walk you through what this is, because it's, um, if you thought the other, if you thought quaff was a little bit reverse engineered, this one, you know, well, I think this one is a bit artificial, but I think it's interesting, very interesting problem. So let me, let me tell you, let me walk you through what this is. Here's intuition. You have some algorithm and you wanna, you wanna show that it doesn't exist, and the algorithm is sort of, you know, again, trying to estimate the output probability of all zeros. Now, how are we gonna compare this algorithm? We're gonna compare it to another algorithm, which we think is sort of the trivial thing to do, which is output one over two to the n, because that's the uniform probability. Right? And you want to say that no matter what algorithm you have, classical algorithm that outputs this p value, this, p, this value of p, right? that it's not, it, 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 you know, it can't be much better than the trivial algorithm that outputs 1 over 2 to the n regardless of the circuit. Okay? That's the intuition. How are we going to measure how well these two algorithms do? It's going to be this mean squared error. What, all right, what do I mean by mean squared error? It's going to be expectation over the choice of circuit of the squared, of, of the squared, the, the different squared. Why do we have this? Well, because that's what the reduction gave us, right? What is the reduction going to be? Well, you're going to work it out. Uh, I'm not going to do it on the spot because it's messy, but you already see the intuition. It's exactly the same intuition. In other words, you know, the fact that if hog is easy, and this x quath assumption is false, that's the contrapositive of what we want, that's quite simple to see. The, the structure of the argument is quite simple to see. The fact that you get this is not you know, super simple, it just involves some tedious calculations that we won't get to, you will do it later, maybe today. Uh, but um, but how, how does the reduction go? So I have an x hog algorithm. Right, I'll start, so you have the x hog algorithm, you output the list, right, what do you do? But no way, come on. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you do exactly the same thing. You do some hiding argument to, to, to have a random, a random outcome rather than all zeros, right? You, 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 you then accept if, um, if, if a randomly chosen guy in the list is, is, is like that. Except here, sorry, means you output b over 2 to the n, whatever the, the heavy thing is, right? b is, say, 2. Um, otherwise, you, uh, you flip a coin, you... Right? You output either b over 2 to the n or 1 over 2 to the n. That's the heavy versus not heavy. And I'm going to let you uh, work on this uh, yourself to, to see that this is the sort of hardness assumption you get. Not so, super surprising that the square should be here, though. Why, why, any ideas, my intuition, why, why does the square come up so naturally? Like, why are we, the mean squared error? That's very, very natural for XEB. Why is that? Not surprising at all. Yeah, exactly, because what is the XEB? It's the dot product. If, you, if you're looking at the ideal distribution, right? in other words, if, if, if PX equal P ideal, then clearly you're taking a whole bunch of squares. Right? So you know, at a high level, XEB is all about the squares of the output distribution. So it's not, su not surprising at all that this is going to be the measure that we're going to talk about. The rest is exactly the same as the, 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 the reduction we were talking about before. Just a little bit more simple pushing. That's it. Yeah. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. Good. It should, in the sense that we're going to talk about algorithms that can do better than we think because, because of some depth issue. But no, not as written. Not as written. Yep. Uh, question. Of course, you can always add a depth, I think, and then you're probably in better, somewhat better uh, shape. We'll talk about that in a moment, actually. 
Um, uh, other questions? Okay, great. How much time? Uh, ten, minutes. ten minutes. Okay, I'm going I'm to try to, uh, to go a little bit fast through what's next. If we need to slow down because it wasn't clear, we'll go back to it tomorrow. Okay, so let me give you a few open questions first. I've always thought of this intuitively as a very lossy reduction and that you're sort of giving away that this bias, this one over two to the n bias is kind of maybe unnecessary, uh, maybe more of a function of the reduction than it is, you know, anything about the hardness of hog, but I don't know. Like, I don't know a better reduction. It just seems like you're losing this one over two to the n bias because you're sort of naively picking a random outcome and maybe there's something better you can do. I really don't, I don't know. I don't know of one, but it seems lossy to me, okay? Um, Another thing that's really important about XEB, which my group has worked on for a long, long time now, several years, is that we think there's actually like, like real reasons to care about the XEB score. So it's not just that it, you know, it might be hard and it's sort of contrived. Um, we actually think that under relatively mild assumptions about the noise, um, it well approximates n-body fidelity. Okay? So you know, fidelity, uh, sort of the overlap of the state that you're, at, the, the, you know, uh, the state that you're implementing and, and the ideal state. That's something that experimentalists really, really care about. Uh, fidelity is very hard to measure. It takes a lot of samples. And under reasonably mild assumptions about the noise in the experiment, actually fidelity is the same as XEB, which is really cool because XEB is really cool because XEB is sample efficient, right? We didn't know how to do that before. I think, in fact, that's probably the legacy of XEB, well past quantum advantage, that it's going to give us a, a somewhat sample efficient but not computationally efficient proxy to measuring fidelity in relatively large systems. Not infinitely large, because we have to have a, you know, we have to compute the ideal output probability. We have several papers about this, so you can check them out. Yeah? No, uh, you know, okay. <laughs> that depends who you ask. You ask physicists, they'll say definitely, because what you can do is make loads of assumptions, or okay, let's not pick on them too much. Make some assumptions about the noise in the experiment. And if you make um, noise assumptions, then yeah, there are actually a lot better ways to do this. That shouldn't be super surprising, right? The hardness of these, you know, of these arguments, the reason it's so hard to test TVD or whatever is because we want to assume nothing about the distribution whatsoever. If you make a strong assumption about the, 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 the distribution, Maybe it's not so surprising that you can do a lot better. I personally, as a computer scientist who doesn't really think that much about noise at an experimental level, I'm worried about that, right? Why? Let's go back to what we said was the motivation of this whole thing. To me, I want to think of adva quantum advantage as a test of quantum physics. It's not a test of quantum physics if you're assuming that quantum physics works in a very strong way. Now, I will say that even me, I often, you know, cheat a little bit and I say, okay, well, maybe we're gonna make a little assumption to make things easier but you kind of have to think about what those assumptions are and you have to be really, really careful with that sort of thing. So I would say no, I haven't seen really a, go like a, a, a really good sort of computational efficient argument, but people will disagree. Um, these are really, really good questions though. Can I get one more? Yeah. No, it's, I mean, that's true. It's, it's, we, we know what it is. The expectation of the all, all zero output is like one over two to the n. So if n grows, it's clearly going down. But that's not really, I mean, I think, I think what's, what's really going on here is that um, you go back to the first, uh, the, what we talked about last time, right? That's a hard thing to output. The output probability is fundamentally computationally difficult thing. We should not expect there to be, uh, even on average, for a random circuit. That was exactly what we talked about. Shouldn't expect there to be a, a polynomial algorithm for doing that thing. Right? So it's a hard task. It's a hard task as this, in an asymptotic, you know, as, as, as n gets larger and larger. It does also happen to get smaller and smaller. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Of course people do that, right? And in fact, you know, the way they really, even Google, the way they're like measuring their largest XEB, right? Is, is by sort of doing some game where they kind of cut half of the system, kind of look at XCB of that, cut another half of the system, look at the XCB of that, right? Then sort of make some, some plot, 
right? And, and so it's not too different from what you're saying. You're sort of extrapolating somehow, and you're sort of trying to become confident that this is at least what you're expecting at smaller systems. You can do process tomography if you like. Uh, the problem with that is that, okay, this is now more of a computer scientist speaking and less of a physicist. I think physicists like that a lot. Right, they say, well, what would happen? What could possibly happen? If, you, if you're seeing something at 20 qubits, it seems to work. You look at two 20 qubit system sizes, they both seem to work. What could possibly happen when you get larger? Well, I'm not really sure what would happen, but what I do know is that the whole point of quantum advantage is to be testing this high complexity regime. Right? And so if you make a really strong assumption, you're, you're, you're testing the high complexity regime by assuming something in the smaller regime, right? That to me sounds like an assumption I might not be comfortable with, right? Fundamentally, and in fact what I've learned from thinking about this for years and years and years now, even the experimentalists don't really understand their noise very well on a very large scale, right? So we hope, for example, that there's not large scale correlated noise, right? We hope that the noise is very localized. Do we know that? Depends who you ask. Um, I would say we probably don't, and so I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable making a lot of assumptions about the noise, even the sort of assumptions that you said. Of course, it's, if you know it fails for 20, then that's not such a good sign for 53, but they've tested 20 and it seems to work pretty well. Yeah, it, it, looks like it's, it looks like there's some correlations, but they're relatively minor. It, it's basically local, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, sorry, I would like to go ahead in the like, what, five minutes I have, something? Okay, five or 10, Let, let's take 10. Uh, so um, uh, here's, what I, here's what I like to say. Here's sort of the surprise, I would say. In fact, this is to me, there are a few simulation results that came out. This is, to me, maybe the one that caught me off guard the most. Okay? Uh, this was in 2021 um, by Shun Gao and, uh, and a few other collaborators. Um, I think, actually, Boaz Barak was also on that paper. Then it was explained in a more recent paper um, by Dorita Haranov and also Shun Gao and others, Umesh Fazarani, Yun Chao Liu. But I think they're most, okay, from my opinion, the most surprising result here was the following. It turns out that x quoth is false, okay? Uh, now, it's only false at sublinear depths, why we were talking about depths earlier when that came up, okay? Uh, but there's actually an algorithm, it's a very simple algorithm, it turns out, that, 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 that actually gives you, uh, you know, a, uh, uh, an x quoth score that does better than this one over two to the n thing when d is less than n, okay? I, I think it was a very surprising result, especially for computer scientists. Let me also say it doesn't falsify x hog, right? Because remember, what was, the, what was the reduction? At least not in the, noisy, not in the noise list case, right? The reduction was just that it's a, if you want to prove that x hog is hard, it suffices to show that x quoth is hard. So x quoth being, uh, Easy, it doesn't say anything, necessarily. It just says, let's not you talk about x, you know, uh, x quoth in this regime, okay? Um, so, so let me start by, so here, I'm just, I'm just calling the x, the x score, I'm just defining it to be this bias of the x quoth algorithm, right? That's exactly what we had written before. X quoth, you know, what x quoth says is that it should be hard to score any better than two to the minus n on this, okay? So th I'm just copying and pasting from what, I was calling this the x score. Yeah? Hopefully we're not confused. Um, why did we think this might be true? We thought this was true because there's this argument of the path integral, that somehow the best thing you could really do to estimate if the all zeros probability was sort of sufficiently heavy or not was to estimate terms in the path integral, just a few of them, because you can't afford to do too many, the polynomial number, to take an average of the value of each of, those, of, of, each of the terms in that path, okay? Now the idea was, well, okay, we're making, like, let's say there's, you know, there's clearly greater than two to the n number of paths, okay, uh, with uniform value and expectation. So it's unclear how to achieve an advantage that scales like two to the minus n. It seems like it should be more like two to the minus m or something like that, the size of the circuit, because that's the number of paths scale exponentially with that, okay? Here's the observation, very simple. This is not true, okay? It's true in the computational basis. But by changing the basis, so we're gonna consider the path integral in what I'll call the poly basis. I'll explain what I mean by that in the next few slides. The values of the paths are highly non-uniform, and you can use that to your advantage by simply carefully choosing a particular poly path, 
in your path integral, one of you know, exponential number, but you, you choose that one path, you, out, you calculate the value of just that one path. And remember these polypaths have the, or, sorry, these, these path integrals all have the property that, you know, that we're considering all have the property that the calculating the value of each path is efficient. It's just that there's way too many of them to use that as an algorithm, right? Turns out that actually scales as something like two to the minus O of D, right? So if D is less than N, that's a problem. D is greater than N, not a problem. In fact, remember, that was an assumption in the original, uh, in the original uh, um, uh, Quoth protocol. It just is no, was no longer an assumption, or at least was omitted when people were thinking about this, from XQuoth. On the other hand, there's a reason that we'd want the depth not to be so large in practice. In other words, you know, so okay, here's one solution, but only a computer scientist would say this, unfortunately. Solution is, oh yeah, it only works for sublinear n. Take n equal to n to the 100. Physicist is not so happy with this. Why is physicist not so happy with this? Yeah, because the noise overwhelms you, and it scales exponentially in d, at the very least. Depending on what you're talking about, sometimes dn, d times n. So you want to keep d shallow, okay? So that's the big problem here. Okay. Um, well, let's see. What, what, two minutes? Three? Five, Five minutes? Okay, then I'm going to keep pushing. Uh, let, me, let me tell you what a polypath integral is, okay? Um, so rather than thinking about a quantum circuit as applying a unitary gate to a vector, okay, we're going to just think about this in, in, in density matrix territory, just for analysis, right? Uh, so we're going to think about it as applying unitary channels to density, to density matrices that happen to start in the pure, in the pure state, all zeros. Yeah? Okay. Now we're going to denote the normalized poly operators by this P sub n notation. I'm just normalizing them by square root n, otherwise it's just i, x, y, z, tensor n. Okay, no big deal. This is a basis, so we can write any n qubit density matrix as you know, a combination of these uh, n, n qubit poly operators, where the coefficient on any particular n qubit poly operator is trace of t times rho. That's elementary quantum, uh, to, you know, quantum information. Okay, now, in the computational basis, we write this output amplitude as a sum over paths of sort of what we call like a, you know, uh, I'll call it a transition amplitude. It's this, it's this x, y thing. It's just, in fact, an entry in the unitary, right, times the coefficient, okay? Very similar way in the poly basis, you can write the, you know, the, um, the, co the poly coefficient of the s poly, that, that's an n qubit poly, right, uh, after you apply a unitary to whatever density, opera whatever density operator you're talking about, that's rho, as is sum over an exponential number, you know, all of these n qubit uh, poly operators, right, uh, of a transition amplitude, it's, 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 I'll call it a transition amplitude, it's um, this trace of s u t u transpose, and then times the coefficient, right? This is not, again, this is elementary. The way you, you, way you obtain that is nothing more than plugging in rho into this expression that I have before, where you write it as a combination of, you know, n qubit poly operators, and then you use linearity of trace. That's how I get that. Okay, now, now we, can, we, can, we can express this as a poly operator. We can, sorry, yeah. we can express the output probability, px or p all zero, let's say, of the circuit as a poly path integral. Uh, and it shouldn't surprise you. Let's, let C, let's break up C into each layer of the gate. Now, I, just for convenience, because I see what's coming next, and you probably don't, uh, I, I'm not, these are not two qubit gates anymore. I could have written them as two qubit gates. Instead, these are just layers of, of two qubit gates, okay? CD times CD minus one and so on, where each of these guys acts on n qubits, and you can think of them as n over two two qubit gates, okay? Just for convenience. Uh, okay, now we write the output probability. Let's maybe think about px, but it could be p, p0, whatever. Any outcome probability can be written like this. What is this? Well, poly, this is the polypath integral. It's a sum over all polypaths. Each polypath is a d plus one tuple of n qubit poly operators, okay? And it's, it's written like this. The value of each path is just the product of a whole bunch of traces. There's the bookends. The bookends are just the, you know, the corresponding coefficients of the input and output state. Those are the, that's the first and the last term, okay? And then the, in between all of the other traces, 
Those are just the transition amplitudes. How do you get this expression? How do you derive it? That's a problem on your, on your sheet, but you've seen everything you, know, you need to know to derive this expression. You repeatedly apply what? You repeatedly apply the uh, yeah, I mean, okay, okay, hold on, I, yes, I, I, classically it's very simple, sorry, in the computational base it's very, sim it's very easy to see that that's the resolution of the, the identity. Here it may be a bit harder to see, but what I, wa what I wanted to say is just that you repeatedly apply this, this equation that I had before, right, where we were expressing this particular poly coefficient as a sum over a particular thing. We just do this, that was for one unitary applied to rho, just do this again and again and again and again, what you then get is you know, a d plus one tuple of n qubit poly operators because you get a different one every single time you apply the unitary of which there are d, uh, there, there, there are d right? Uh, and you get something like this. Okay, and we're just going to define this to be a sum uh, over, 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 all poly, you know, um, over all values of a function f, which is just going to be defined to be the value of the path. So f is, a, and there's nothing more than a definition. I'm just defining f and c and s and x to be the value of the path, because that's what the path depends on. Okay, good. Now, oh, we're, done, we're out of time? Okay, good. Then here's what, I'm going, here's what we're going to do. Here's how the algorithm works. I'll describe why it works next time. Algorithm is going to simply pick a very special path, okay, and compute that path and output it. That's all, that's all it's going to do. Okay, we'll talk about that next time, and then we'll talk about noise. Thanks.